Hi everyone, my name is Essen and you are listening in to the Brown History Podcast. In 1948, when Israel declared itself as an independent state, it quickly seeked international recognition from other countries, including a newly independent India. Nehru, who was the Prime Minister then, was not on board. Even Albert Einstein personally wrote to Nehru, requesting India's support, but Nehru declined. Instead, India allied itself with the Palestinians, and at the United Nations, 33 nations voted in favor of Israel, while 13 countries voted against, including India. However, now, India has become Israel's biggest and most dependable purchaser of weapons. What happened? On today's episode, we sit with Azad Isa, author of Hostile Homelands, and discuss the history of the relationship between India and Israel. It's a really fascinating episode, and it's one of the longest episodes, probably the longest episode of the podcast, but it's really worth it, I promise. Um, Before we get started, if you are a big fan of Brown History Podcast, Brown History Instagram account, the whole thing consider being a patron. Just visit brownstreetpodcast.com. Your support goes a long way, I promise. Anyways, let's get started. Here we go. All right. So, um so let's let's go back to the start, right? It's 1947 and India becomes an independent nation from the British. The British make the borders which which brings partition, many lives are lost and displaced. And similarly, the state of Israel was created in 1948, and the borders were drawn up by the British. And that sparked a war that left many displaced. But a a major difference between the two is that India was a nation that was a result of anti-colonialism movement, whereas Israel came to being thanks to the British. And also you have Pakistan and Israel, which were both created for the explicit purpose of securing a homeland for religious minorities. So if India didn't support Pakistan, which I don't think it did, but if it didn't and then it would support Israel, it would be kind of a hypocritical thing. So I wanted to know what was the relationship between Israel and India during the 1940s when everything was new. So thank you, uh, Asen, for um, for having me and to, to, to discuss this. It's a, it's a complicated topic, and so I, I hope we are able to uh, get through it without uh, uh, tripping over ourselves. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thanks for this question. Um, you know, firstly, I, I would like to say that, um, you know, there wasn't like one India, you know, uh, throughout history. And um, it was only India when, when it became India in 1947, right? Right. So there's always this attempt to kind of create this idea that there was this um, kind of political unity on the subcontinent, but mm-hmm. there wasn't. Um, and India was a new nation at the time of partition, just as Pakistan was. And how partition came about was, um, you know, a result of, of course, the British, but also the demands of various communities um, that lived under colonial rule. So we know, of course, that the British eventually um, drew up the lines and divided the regions of Punjab and Bengal, um, which is ultimately what led to the violence and the migration and the displacement that took place. Uh, At the same time, um, when we think about uh, the partition context, we have to also acknowledge that um, some, uh, of course, not all, but, uh, you know, quite a few Muslims did want Pakistan, you know, the the idea of which wasn't necessarily um, Actually, originally, it wasn't necessarily a separate nation state, but it was actually um, a Muslim majority, like autonomous states, which uh, the Indian National Congress rejected, you know. Um, And so this was because they wanted, you know, they felt that they wanted to protect what they perceived as uh, Muslim political interests and survival Mm -hmm. amid what they saw as um, increasingly India becoming, you know, a Hindu majoritarian state given the statements at the time. So they, they understood that, um, or they felt that they were going to be under attack at some point. So they wanted um, some political, um, um, some political um, power in that case. It, it wasn't necessarily um, the creation of a state originally, but that came into being later. But, um, I, and I hope I'm, on, uh, I'm answering your question, but um, you know, both leaders from the International Congress, as well as the Hindu Mahasabha, right, um, uh, made statements that scared Muslims, okay? And so ultimately scholars have argued that it was eventually um, the Indian National Congress and groups like the Hindu Mahasabha that called for partition of Punjab and Bengal and not the leaders of the Muslim League uh, who wanted the unity of these provinces. Um, with regards to Pakistan and Israel, this, this comes up a lot. Um, 
And some have made the argument that uh, there are similarities between the founding of both nations. And on some level, um, you know, there is some overlap. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, both deal with either the Muslim question on the subcontinent or the, the Jewish question in Europe and the plight of minorities uh, under European uh, colonial modernity. However, this sort of comparison stops because Pakistan um, was not created as a settler colonial entity as Israel. Okay, So its main advocates and, and Jinnah uh, did not want to displace people or remove people from the other community, from their homes, in the creation of a new state. Whereas Israel, uh, whereas, whereas Zionist, uh, Zionist ideologies and Zionist discourses imagined uh, Palestine to be a land uninhibited, uh, uninhabited by people. Okay, this is the this is was the the slogan, you know. Um, and um, uh, what is it uh, for, for people without a land? Uh, what is it? Um, uh, people without a land for a land without a people, something like that, you know. Um, so this was not the case of Pakistan, which was uh, attempting uh, political sovereignty um, where Muslims were already the majority. So, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the differences in that. That's case. a big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. So when um, when Israel declared itself as a state in 1948, and it asked for support from a lot of countries around the world, and a lot of the a lot of them did support, and I think USSR did, and America did. Where did India stand on this? Because India itself was anti-colonial, and like I said before, Israel is kind of a colonial result. Yeah. So you know, um, there are two. There are two aspects to this. Uh, okay, let's say three aspects, or maybe four aspects. Let's see where I go. Oh boy! But uh, you know, so so in in the twenties, in the twenties and thirties, Gandhi and Nehru uh, were of the opinion that any sort of Jewish state in Palestine would be a British imperial outpost, right? And so Gandhi was sympathetic to the state of the affairs of Jews in Europe, be it in like Russia, you you know, or Ukraine, or in Germany. But um, you know he was um, he was not in support of a state um, and and this kind of like um, kicking out of Palestinians. You know you you may recall or your listeners may recall a famous quote in which Gandhi says something like you know uh, Palestine belongs uh, to the Arabs in the same way the English uh, England belongs to the English or the or, the, or France belongs to uh, the French. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he says, what is going on in Palestine today cannot be justified by any moral, moral code of conduct. You know? uh, so this becomes the quote everyone ascribes to Gandhi. Uh, however, after World War II, he seemed to be moved by the Holocaust and he kind of changed his mind. Um, and he told an American journalist, uh, quote, if the Arabs have a claim to Palestine, the Jews have a prior claim. Okay, this is what he says. At the, but but uh, you know that's after World War II, and Indian foreign policy has already kind of, kind of already been set by that time, and so it's hard to go back on it. Um, and I'll get back to that point in a bit. Um, likewise, with Nehru, he saw Jewish migration into Palestine as something colonial as well. But um, when you know the convents in Bandung takes place, you know in Indonesia with the launch of the Non-Aligned Movement. Um, you know, um, in, in, this was in 1955, you know, India becomes like this uh, leader uh, of the third world. Um, Nehru is actually fine with Israel being invited um, to that conference. So imagine this conference is about the third world, so-called third world countries coming together to um, form an alliance against the imperial countries, right? And mm-hmm. Nehru is actually okay with Israel being invited, but it's only when Indonesia and the Arab countries tell him, no, we don't want Israel to be there. That he actually concedes and says, "Okay, that's fine." But the narrative that gets pushed forward is that the non-aligned movement supports the third world, and they were anti-Israel. India was a leader of the non-aligned movement, so therefore, India didn't want Israel to be part of the non-aligned movement. But that was not the case. Yeah, okay, right. So. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that this kind of indecision, right, would inform India's two-faced policy in that way. Um, and and um, parallel to, to what's going on with the Indian national, national movement, right, you have the Hindu nationalists 
and they were in favor of Germany and Italy's fascism, okay, and the persecution of Jews, because it helped them make an argument that India was a Hindu country too, and it, it needed Muslims to adapt or leave. So they liked the supremacy mm -hmm. and the social revolution that was taking place in Europe. Um, and, they, and they felt that they could make that same argument, the Jews in Europe and the Muslims in India, they are the problem for our, our societies. But <laughs> the difference was that they were also or equally enamored by the inroads Zionists had made in Palestine over the 20s and early 30s, because they, they, were, they were so enthralled by how these Jews that had come from Europe had gone to this place in Palestine, put Muslims in their place, basically. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and, and the kind of development that they, they, uh, they seem to be making there, uh, the inroads. So this seems like contradictory in a way, where you are sort of, um, on one hand, you're supporting the fascism against Jews, and on the other hand, you're supporting the Zionist Jews in Palestine, but actually it's the same thing. It's like supporting fascism, supporting ethno-nationalist um, states and, and supporting Islamophobia in general. So, so in 1950, Israel first recognizes Israel. Yeah. Um, we, go, we go in a few years, we go from the non-alignment movement, not wanting Israel there, where India is a leader. And then all of a sudden, just a few years later, India recognizes Israel as a state. How, what happens in between these years that makes India yeah. able to do this? Yeah. So India recognizes Israel in 1950, in September 1950. So I think it becomes clear that Israel was not going anywhere. right? And so uh, it was now part of the UN. Um, and in the end, the decision to recognize Israel is not one that's driven by any principle. So if you look at the letters that were sent between the Arab diplomats, you know, from the Middle East to Delhi, uh, in which they sort of deliberate um, how this, this uh, how to come to a decision with regards to um, recognizing Israel. They don't mention Palestine at all. They don't talk mm. about whether this whether this will impact uh, Palestine or impact our relationship with Palestinians. All they're concerned about is that uh, would there be a backlash from you know the Arab world? Now, what's interesting here is that. Um, Nine months prior to Israel, um, uh, India, uh, India recognizing Israel, China recognizes Israel. And okay. um, once China recognizes Israel, it allows India to feel comfortable that there won't be a major backlash. Okay. And so in 1950, it allows Israel to open up a small immigration office in Bombay, you know, thousands of kilometers away from um, the, the, the main, like the capital, right? So it's just a small office and they recognize Israel to essentially keep their options open. Okay. So we, we, here we just talked about how um, India recognizes Israel as a state. Okay. But what happens to the relationship between Israel and Palestine, uh, India and Palestine now? Does that like dissolve? And throughout the decades, you know, with the PLO and the Yasser Arafat, what happens there? Okay. So you are saying, you're asking basically, what happens after India recognizes Israel? Yeah, exactly. Essentially, what happens is that uh, after India recognizes Israel in 1950, nothing actually changes with regards to how India uh, looks at Palestine in terms of their public, um, their public uh, statements and their, and their public policies, their foreign, foreign policy. You must remember that India was part of the non-aligned movement um, and it was it was also leaning towards uh, the Soviet Union um, during the Cold War, and um, and this means that it was uh, its public posture was necessarily towards uh, Palestine, right? But what it did have was that it had these kind of like uh, backdoor channels with Israel during that period. So, for instance, in 1962, when India and China went to war. Um, India was in trouble and it needed uh, arms and needed assistance. So it wrote to several countries around the world, including um, Israel. He wrote, he, Nehru wrote to Ben Gurion and uh, Ben Gurion replied and said, we can't supply you with weapons because Israel was desperate to try and get India's support mm -hmm. um, as, as a country because India was the leader of the non-aligned movement. You know, it was a leader of, these, of the third world countries to get India's endorsement 
would mean to would mean it will open the the gates to other countries' endorsements, basically. Um, and so, when India um, wrote to Nehru, uh, sorry, when Nehru wrote to Ben Gurion, and he wrote back and said, "We'll give you arms." Nehru wrote back and said, "Yes, can you please send those arms, but send it on, on a ship that does not have a flag, of mm. the Israeli flag." And uh, Ben Gurion said no, and uh, the arms came anyway. Um, then um, uh, uh, Egypt uh, protested against this uh, this move, and India promised that it would stop working with Israel, but it actually didn't stop. It received um, arms in '65. It uh, it uh, received arms in '71. Uh, so '65 and '71 were, were against like West Pakistan at the time. Right, and um, and, is, uh, and and Israel became the first country or one of the first countries to um, to recognize Bangladesh, you know, after that war, and um, so uh, essentially, um, India was very supportive of Palestine in terms of its uh, voting at the UN, in terms of its support of Yasser Arafat, uh, in, in in its support of the PLO, um, it was the first non-Arab country to recognize. Um, the PLO, I believe, uh, it gave um, Palestinians an embassy later on. It had an embassy, a Palestinian embassy, before it had an Israeli embassy, you know. Um, so these things are really important. At the same time, it was sort of uh, very enamored by um, Israel's sort of um, uh, growth and militaristic power in the Middle East. So the 1967 um, war, you know, um, the Arab-Israeli 1967 war, right? Yeah. Uh, which lasted a matter of days. Um, India was very enamored by it. And um, there was a lot of pushback in Indian parliament and amongst like uh, the right wing and amongst even some sort of like libertarian or liberal parties in India asking um, the Indian government to reconsider their ties, um, you know, with uh, the Arab world in terms of like, um, can they please uh, normalize ties with Israel instead, you know, uh, because they're not actually gaining that much from the Arab world and they could probably gain more, you know. From right. Israel, you know, because uh, Israel won the war. Israel won the war and they won it in, like, in, in, in just several days. And, uh, you know, you know, this. Uh, so, so essentially um, th there was a lot more deliberation and uh, discussion than what people assume there to be regarding this. So during that time, you could say during that time until the 90s, it was very clear that India was always publicly posturing itself towards Palestine, but it was doing all of these underhand things. I'll give you one, one more example. Uh, in the late 60s, Indira Gandhi essentially um, built up RAW, you know, um, the, the foreign intelligence agency. And she also instituted um, ties between the Mossad and RAW from her office. You know, and Yasser Arafat called her uh, my sister. And yes, she is essentially creating these ties between these two foreign intelligence agencies. You know, uh, in the 80s, you know, wow. with, um, with the, um, the storming of the Golden Temple in, 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 um, Amritsar. in Amritsar, right? Um, major event, major horrific event uh, that takes place. Um, those forces were trained by Israelis, you know. Um, so... So yeah, so there's a kind of duality on Indian yeah policy essentially. In the in the nineties, the Cold War ends, and we have this new era. Uh, the Soviet Union dissolves in ninety two. The nineties saw uh, India economy grow significantly because India saw economic liberalization. So in ninety ninety two, one of one major milestone is that India establishes full diplomatic relationships with Israel. How did that come about? And what happens to Palestine in this equation? Yeah, so even this one, there's a lot of dimensions to the question. It's a good question. Um, you know, the, the first, the, the move to improve relations with um, Israel begins not after co the Cold War, but it happens in the period just before the Cold War ends, you know? Um, and and I, I referred to it, I referred to some of those developments in the late 60s and, sorry, yeah, the late 60s and the early uh, 70s and in the early 80s with, with what happened in Amritsar, right? Um, so it happens in the decade before the Cold War ends and Prime Minister Indira Gandhi um, 
and her son Rajiv Gandhi are basically the architects of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi, in particular, saw the project of um, liberalization or the joining of the the global economy, right, as linked with being close to Israel. You know, so if India wants to modernize, in other words, they got to be close to Israel and close to the U.S. So, right. so, so um, Rajiv Gandhi was also told in the 80s that. If you want to be close to the U.S., right? I was actually told this by the um, by the Anti Defamation League and the uh, American Jewish Committee, um, the AJC. Um, they told him that if you want to be close to the U.S., you need to reconsider your relations with Israel being so difficult. You know, at the time in the 80s, India was not even giving visas to Israeli athletes to come to play even tennis in India. You know, right. So it was on such a level that uh, these organizations were t- sending messages to Rajiv Gandhi saying, give these guys visas to play tennis. You know? um, if you want to be close to, to the U.S., you know, can you imagine? Yeah. Um, so at the same time, there were there was this pressure within India from like, again, certain liberals, certain Hindu nationalists um, saying that, you know, we need to diversify. You know, we can't be relying on this, uh, on the Soviet Union, that you know seems to be collapsing in a way, right? And it collapses in in ninety two, um, uh, in nineties, uh, and, um, and so when the Cold War ends, India feels that um, it needs to arm itself, right, further, and it looks to Israel for that. And believe it or not, um, China establishes diplomatic ties. And then India follows again, basically. It's remarkable. So like, um, you know, one of my interviewees told me, he said that it's, it just shows how unimaginative the Indian foreign policy could be, you know. Um, essentially that um, it's very cautious, very, very cautious. It's always like... Uh, Let's see what they do first and then we'll follow if it works yeah, out. Yeah, very much so. Not very, not very um, confident in that way. Right. So why why was it America so open to India at the time? Because it sounds like um, they're like closed off to India. Yeah, because India was essentially under the sphere of the influence of uh, the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So it was very close to the Soviet Union, even though it was so-called neutral in the Cold War. But being under the, the influence of the Soviet Union and being a harsh critic of American foreign policy, you mm-hmm. know, during the Cold War, India was were not close to to the U.S. at all, and also America was this, you know, this capitalist haven, you know, and India was India had uh, had a lot of its industries and all of that very pretty much nationalized, and and so um, uh, the the U.S. and India were far apart when it came to the way they saw things, and so um, the U.S. did not essentially trust India, mm. um, and uh, and didn't Pakistan, sell weapons. Yeah, absolutely. Did not sell weapons to them either. There was they, they and that's why uh, the, the the Indians were getting weapons from the Soviet Union. And also during that period as well, Pakistan was under the sphere of influence of the U.S. You know, and so so that's how the Cold War sort of like played out. You know, Pakistan was on the side of the U.S. to uh, to some extent, and India was on the side of uh, the the Soviet Union. And even if like they were not exactly partaking in this in this war as such. Um, that's how it played out. And so India uh, India needed to sort of like, uh, quote unquote, prove itself to the U.S. that it become a reliable ally, you know. Um, and it also wanted to be close to the U.S. because it was also seeing China as a future threat. Right. And so it understood that um, the U.S. was probably its best chance to, to gain support for that. In 2008, uh, the Mumbai attacks happened, you know, 2611. How did 2611 change the relationship between Israel and India? Yeah, these attacks were major. Um, and they were immediate, immediately uh, blamed um, on Pakistan-based groups. And so one of the differences uh, with this attack um, in Mumbai was that Israeli citizens were killed during this attack. And this meant that um, Israel became personally invested in, in the issue. And so what that meant was that it, it basically gave the green light to Delhi and to Tel Aviv 
to expand security cooperation. That's exactly what they did. It, it became like this opportunity to do so. So immediately after 26, um, 11, Mumbai police began sending, you know, the officers to train for training in Israel. Just how, uh, just as you get um, the U.S. sending police officers to Israel for training, um, the Indian police started to go. Um, the Indian government also began utilizing um, uh, techniques of um, mass surveillance on its population. So, and they and they started using, um, you know, uh, Israeli technology for that. Um, in like a couple of years later, uh, in 2010, India started using Israeli drones to search for the Naxalites, you know, the, the, the communists in the yeah. forest, uh, Chhattisgarh and, and elsewhere. So what happens after 2611 is that the arms purchases in particular are going to overdrive. The arms deal transaction between the two have has increased openly and significantly. Yeah. In 2014, Modi becomes the new leader of India. And around the same time, Israel bombs the Gaza Strip, killing more than a thousand civilians. How does he change India's relationship with Israel? And how does that change with Palestine? And and when the Gaza when the Gaza Strip was bombed, that was a moment that would reveal where each person stands, I guess. Hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So how does that go about? Mm-hmm. This is hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 um, it's, it, 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 these are sort of like um, obvious questions and yet they, they are so tied up with different things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, There's so many layers to it that it's very difficult to, to say what I want to say or like to just ask her. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, you know, Modi becomes prime minister in 2014. Um, I guess the first layer to it is that he is serenaded and he's supported by uh, Western leaders, Western publications. Uh, people forget this. You know, people talk about Modi now doing crazy things with like the BBC documentary, for instance. Yeah. But, um, you know, Modi was basically you know, given a green light to become the prime minister. Um, and they kind of knew, these Western leaders knew what he had done in Gujarat. They knew what he stood for. They had all that, all that intelligence, which has been coming out of late and will come out, I'm, I'm guessing, in the, in the years to come. Um, and uh, they, they, they saw it as an opportunity for them again to you know, make money, essentially. Because right. what he's doing is that he started privatizing things even further. It was like the next phase. So in the 90s, this privatization move starts taking place, of which started in the 80s, but in the 90s, it starts increasing. And then with Modi coming to power, you have the rise of major billionaire class in India. You know, think about the Adanis and the Ambanis and all of those guys. Um, they start you know, purchasing all the ports and purchasing all the airports and building all these infrastructure projects of which they are, you know, they're getting all this sort of like Western investors and all of that. So I know it's not directly linked to your question, but it's, it's, it's important to know that, you know, there was a lot of money to be made when Modi came to power and it wasn't for the people. It was pretty much for a billionaire class, right? And, mm-hmm. and Western, Western investors understood that. Anyway. Modi becomes uh, prime minister and essentially the relationship between India and Israel simply comes out in the open. Now you mentioned 2611 and you mentioned that in, uh, you, you asked like, how did it change? Okay, so it changed in around 2008, but Modi wasn't prime minister then, it was Manmohan Singh. And the deals, you know, uh, under Manmohan Singh, we're already around $1 billion a year, you know, in terms of arms. But the difference was that Manmohan Singh wouldn't be seen with Netanyahu. He wouldn't go and hang out with Netanyahu. Um, Modi instead travels a couple of years later uh, to Israel. He goes to Haifa, rolls up his pants and walks on the shoreline, dips his feet and toes into the water, into the Mediterranean Sea and sort of like baptizes this, this relationship, like, you know, starts anew in a way. Yeah. And, um, uh, Modi likes Israel because it is unashamedly like Jewish. It's unashamedly religious at its core. Even though it says it's, it's sort of like a, 
democratic, like secular state, etc. But it's a Jewish state, okay? And he likes that. And it's a militaristic state, strong militaristic state. He likes that too. And this is important for him because this is what he wants India to be ultimately, all right? So India and Israel become strategic partners. I'll get back to your uh, question on Gaza. But India and Israel become strategic, strategic partners. They sign agreements on agriculture, on technology, uh, even on, on cultural exchange. Um, and this new program begins. But, what, but as, you, as you correctly point out, this all starts off in 2014, you know? And this new program and this new like propaganda program starts in which uh, India and Israel are both projected as kind of like this age old civilizations and age old friends, you know? Uh, and they make every attempt to um, highlight these symmetries. So they say like, uh, they focus on democracy. Israel is the only one in the Middle East and India is the, this miracle biggest democracy or the largest democracy. Uh, and they ignore sort of the occupations and the discriminatory laws. Uh, they focus on being targeted by quote unquote terrorists, which what they wanna, wanna say is Muslims, okay? They talk about development, but they forget uh, or they refuse to think about um, the fact that this development means basically, you know, ethnic cleansing, you know, in, and evictions. So we go back to 2014 where this, as you say, everything comes out in, into the open as such, you know, right. and 2000, uh, 2000 Palestinians were killed in 2014, right? Uh, I think it was 2200 and 67 Israelis were also killed. It was a horrific campaign by the Israelis. Um, the first thing that happens is that Modi blocks um, an attempt for a resolution condemning the violence in India's parliament. That's the first thing that happens. And then um, India agrees for the Human Rights Council to, um, to conduct an investigation into, into what happened. But when the report comes out, it abstains from, from endorsing the report when it comes out in 2015. So what happens then, as you say correctly, is that it becomes clear that India at that point is not even willing to provide Palestinians with even the performative support because the endorsement of the report is important. Of course, it is important, but it doesn't really do anything, okay? But by abstaining from the report, you are basically saying that you're not even willing to even say that something went wrong there and something was terribly like messed up about that campaign. You're not even willing to even say that, even dis and despite knowing that that report is actually not gonna do anything ultimately, there's gonna be no cens censure or no accountability from the Israelis, you know? Um, so that's what happens and that starts in 2014. Um, and so when they meet in 2014, what becomes clear is that, um, you know, uh, Modi and Netanyahu start talking on the phone as a result, after that, they start talking on the phone and they start discussing things, and um, and and so and so Mo, Netanyahu is essentially asking Modi, you know, to to not do certain things, you know, mm -hmm. for his own reputation, basically. But in 2018, and I was surprised to find this out, but Modi actually visits Ramallah, so there still is a Palestine-Indian relationship, somewhat. Yeah. Is it just for show or? No, it's, it's absolutely for show. Um, basically, what, what, is, what happens is that India's, India's foreign policy going forward has now taken on this approach of having this sort of like a dehyphenated approach in which it's no longer Israel, Palestine. It's like when they talk about Israel, they don't have to talk about Palestine. Okay. Um, so, so what happens is that, um, you know, he visits... What's important to know here is that everything is very calculated. Okay, he he goes to visit um, Netanyahu, right, in 2017. But before he visits Netanyahu, he visits a number of or several Arab states, and he gets their approval as well. You know, we don't know what exactly they discuss, but the fact that he goes there and then goes to Israel says enough. Basically, he has gone there and basically created these relationships with these Arab countries. Okay. And, he's, and so he has basically went, gone to test, you know, t test the situation to see like, okay, what it would be like, you know, um, what's the mood like basically from these places. And so then he goes to Netanyahu. Then he goes to uh, Ramallah afterwards. 
And what he does is that he goes there and he gives them money, basically. He gives them, uh, I can't remember the exact amount, but you know, some million dollars, right? Now, if we're talking about a few million dollars uh, in terms of aid, in terms of scholarships, how can you compare that to, you know, a billion dollars a year in arms, okay? You're buying arms from Israel, you are essentially subsidizing the Israeli military industrial complex. You are building that military, you know, machine. And right. then you go, to, you go to the people, the victims of the military machine, and then you say, he has a scholarship. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So it's completely performative. It's just to make India appear that they are not taking sides, essentially. Mm-hmm. They're completely taking sides. They've completely washed away. Imagine, I'm from South Africa, all right? So imagine if um, India said, we're going to talk about South Africa and not talk about the ANC, basically. Yeah. We're not going to talk about uh, the Bantu stands that exist in, in apartheid South Africa. We're still going to talk, we're only talking to Pretoria. And then we'll go to the Bantu stand and give them a scholarship. Okay. It absolutely makes no sense. So in terms of international relations, you can spin it to make it make sense because you are saying that India is acting in its own self-interest, which all countries do anyway, all right? Um, But what India has is that it has this, this veneer of the past in which it has Gandhi, it has Nehru, it has the non-aligned movement. And so when it says we are doing something like in a neutral sense, or that we are going to Palestine anyway, it creates the perception that they care. It becomes the, like this Indian exceptionalism in which actually it's not IR, it's actually India continuing with its policy towards being pro-Palestine, but it's absolutely not. And so what the book also tries to explain is that even that veneer that people seem to have about or keep on placing on India, that was also fake from the start, okay? The idea that, you know, uh, Gandhi and Nehru, you know, said these things about uh, Palestine, all right? There was a reason for it, you know, uh, in, the, in the first place. The fir- in the first place, um, you know, they were anti-colonial, but they were anti-colonial to themselves, basically, not anti-colonial on an interse- interse- inter- intersectional way, all right? Mm-hmm. We already know Gandhi was horrific when he came to uh, the plight of Black people in South Africa. You know, you wanted rights for Indians. Okay, in South Africa, or the or the, the the brown people that her, had arrived there, you know, there was no India at that time. But he wanted rights for them. Okay, he didn't didn't fight for rights for everyone when he was in South Africa. That's the truth. Okay, um, he might he might have thought he was being strategic or something, but the fact is that's the fact. Okay, um, the second thing is that uh, he was not great on caste. Okay, so that's also a fact. Okay, and. Um, um, uh, thirdly, when India decided to be like pro-Palestine, you know, um, in, uh, after they were formed as a country, um, they made a deliberate attempt to ensure that they were not going to be in the bad books of the Arab world because they needed energy from the Arab world. This was not like some free, <laughs> free policy that they took, moral policy, oh, we'll be pro-Palestine. No. They were pro-Palestine because they needed to be on the right side of the Arab world. They also, you know, I know you're interested in the Cold War, right? The, 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 they were also interested in, in being pro-Palestine uh, because it made sure that the Arab world did not go towards Pakistan. Okay, It did not move towards Pakistan and it did not move towards taking Pakistan's position when it came to Kashmir. Right. So it, it made it, it kind of like it kind of hid, it allowed them to hide their occupation in in um, in Kashmir. And people also seem to forget that India had to be made into a country. You know, when you think about the annexation of Hyderabad, you think about what happened in the northeastern states. These were all military operations to make India into a country. OK. And so, so when you think about all of that, the colonialism that was taking place anyway there, um, for you to then take a stance that you pro Palestine is really, really like taking the cake. Basically, you being you being really like uh, disingenuous. Um, the final thing is that 
being pro-Palestine in the early days was also a case of understanding that it had currency with the third world. It had currency. When you know that you are a weak country, okay? When you know you're a weak country and you can't roll and ride with the big guys, then who do you ride with? You become the leader of the, the weaker guys, basically. That's what it was. And, and that shows itself today when India now wants to ride with the big guys because its economy is up and running. It's a big country. It has, uh, think about the big tech companies, all right? Uh, think about Google, think about Twitter before Elon Musk came. Who is, who's running these companies? Think about um, television shows, Mindy Kaling, and think about, uh, think about, um, um, Priyanka Chopra, you know, an FBI. It's kind of, you are rolling with the big guys now, You're rolling with the big guys. So do you really need to care about the oppressed anymore? No, you, there's no. So you're, you being with the oppressed was just opportunistic. It was for a moment in time until you, until you graduate into becoming a bully yourself, basically. Wow. Let's talk about uh, Kashmir. You mentioned Kashmir. You can't help to see the similarities between Kashmir and Palestine. Uh, in 2019, Kashmir's status was revoked. And Kashmir is classified as the world's most militarized zone, as well as the largest region occupied by security forces. How does Kashmir come into play here between Israel and India? Okay, on the question of Palestine and Kashmir, this is kind of like a hot topic. People want to talk about the similarities between Palestine and Kashmir. Yeah. You know, they want to talk about it and they want to see it in that way. Yes, there are many, many similarities. It does not mean, however, that they are the same. Okay. People should not think it's the same. Um, so there are many similarities and there are differences. Um, and ultimately, why they are very similar is that they are both, you know, they are both struggles for self-determination. That's the core of it. Okay, both struggle self-determination and they both predate this partitions of, the, of, 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 the, um, of their contexts as such, all right? Both India and Israel see the question of, of Kashmir and Palestine as fundamentally linked to their existence. So whereas Israel argues that Palestinians want to destroy Israel, right? They want to destroy Jews. India argues that they cannot exist without Kashmir. And, and it's a very bizarre argument because you are saying essentially that Here's India, the map of India, okay? And you have one state that is Muslim majority. And that one Muslim majority state is proof that you are a secular country, okay? But that Muslim majority state doesn't want to be with you. It either wants to be on its own or it wants to join Pakistan, all right? And yet you are going to force that state to be there so you can prove your secular secular sort of like credentials. It is crazy. And that's not even a Hindu nationalist perspective. That's the liberal perspective, okay? That's the secular perspective. Hindu nationalist perspective is that that's the head of India. You cut off the head, then India doesn't exist. That's the crown, that's the crown. That's where Sanskrit and, um, um, and, and many sort of like, um, Hindu sciences, you know, in their imagination was built up in, it was in Kashmir that, that happened. And, and Kashmir is not just, is not just the only thing, it's in their imagination, it's the entire Akand Bharat, you know, it's the whole undivided India, it's, it ranges from Afghanistan to, um, to Burma, to Myanmar, that's, yeah. that's undivided India. So in that imagination, that entire area is India. So all of that belongs to India. So you, you have this crazy situation in which the secular Indians see India, see Kashmir as fundamental to its secular credentials, so they won't let it go. And you have this other bunch of guys that see Kashmir as part of a larger India, and they can't let it go. And that's why Patan was also very interesting in that way, because it, the language, the language of the film, you know, the the logic of the film, it assumes also that Kashmir needs to be defended for India, basically, you know. There's no debate around that. It becomes very clear. And, you, and, and it's also very sinister because you have this Muslim guy, Pathan, who then must go and save, um, must save India from an attack uh, from Pakistan based on the fact that Pakistan wants to take revenge um, over Kashmir being taken by India, right? The, the revoc revocation of 370. So they make a lot of assumptions there. 
Now, what's important for this and why this, the, the similarity comes to the fore is that Israel does not have a constitution, right? You, can you imagine that? It does not have a constitution, which means that it does not have a border. It means that Israel can continue for however long it wants to be, okay? And in India's imagination and the Hindu nationalist imagination, there is no border. Akan Bharat also ranges from Afghanistan to Myanmar, but it can ultimately go as far as it goes, basically. Right. So that, these are really important things. It means that Kashmir is uh, suffocated and Palestine is suffocated under this, this sort of like mythical imagination. And how do you argue against that? Right. Then um, the other point is that in terms of like the modern state and, and, and in terms of the, the logics and the, the, the lexicon that's used, both India and Israel use the language of, um, you know, counter insurgency basically, to essentially, and surveillance policies, you know, to basically, um, to say that they have to act in this way for their own security, essentially. So mm -hmm. everything's about their own security, even though they are the, the provokers in this matter. That was really interesting. I don't even know where to go from there. Uh, in, in 2020, there's this <laughs> big event. There's the Abraham Accords. Can you tell me more about what impact, what, first of all, what is that and what impact did it have on global politics and what does it mean for Palestine and for India? The, the Abraham Accords were these so-called peace accords and uh, between the several Arab states and Israel. They were not peace accords, obviously. These were just normaliza normalization ties. It just basically said that Israel is going to normalize ties with these particular Arab states, including the UAE. Um, later Sudan, later Morocco. And if you think about it, essentially it throws Palestinians under the bus, essentially. It all, all it means is that there's no consequence for what has happened over the past several decades. And the UAE is just going to create economic ties with Israel and pretend that everything is fine. And so you have this fake peace as such. And nothing more sort of exemplifies this than how it was done uh, with Sudan and with Morocco. I mean, it's, it's actually quite embarrassing to, to think about that how, how petty it was, you know, and it was, it, was so, it was so specifically done, you know, as a Trump move, so crass, you know. So they go to Sudan and they say, you know, you are uh, on this terror list, basically. You're going to get off the terror list, you recognize Israel. So they're, all right. Right, so they recognize Israel. You know, they, they normalize ties with Israel. They go to Morocco and they say, you want control over Western Sahara? We will recognize your sovereignty over Western Sahara, but you recognize or normalize ties with Israel. So Morocco says, okay, shot. We'll do it, right? Yeah. Blackmail. That's, those are not, that's not peace accords, right? Now, this obviously has major rep repercussions for the Palestinians. It has major repercussions for the Middle East because what it does is that it also uses democracy and peace, the language of peace, to suggest that these new relationships are actually legitimate. But they have no mandate from the people. The people have not, from Morocco, from Sudan, these people, the people have not agreed to these things. These are just states, you know, that have agreed to it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this essentially undermines any possibility of accountability and for justice in the area. And if there's no justice, I mean, the, as, the, as, the, as the line goes, there's no justice, there's no peace. You know, if there's no justice, there's, the situation doesn't go away. So what it does then is that it criminalizes dissent. It's like, oh, you are against the Abraham Accords, so it means you are against peace, essentially. Right. You are, you are a terrorist. You are, you are, uh, you are problematic. So that's what the Abraham Accords does. It also creates that kind of like a carrot and stick situation in which if you support Israel, then you're going to benefit from all these economic deals, essentially. And you can develop and you can do all these things. Um, and, if you, and if you don't, you're going to get the stick. You're going to be put onto a terrorist list, you know, essentially. Now, what that meant was that um, what it meant for India and Israel, it's very important and it's a big deal. Because remember what I told you, is that India is not very imaginative when it comes to its foreign policy. Okay, not my words. If you read the book, you'll find it in there also. <laughs> or my interviewee says that. You know, I, when he told me that, I didn't fully understand it, but I fully understand it now. And essentially, if you think about it, right, India is always waiting, you know, to, before it does something, before it becomes bold, 
it's waiting for like someone to stand behind it and so it show its support. So in the case of recognizing Israel 950, it had China, right? So China does it, it has support. In 1992, it does it, it China is also, you know, around. Now with Abraham Accords, it gives them an open ticket to do whatever they want with Israel, knowing that the Arab world, in terms of these big countries like the UAE, et cetera, are on board. So the mm. Arab world can't say, oh, oh, India, why are you making friends with Israel? Why are you doing all this stuff when they are doing it in any case? So this creates a huge, a huge uh, opportunity for Modi. And in my estimate, and I could be wrong about this, this Abraham Accords essentially, you know, India-Israel's relations were moving very fast, but I think this escalated, this accelerated it tremendously, maybe five years or 10 years faster than where, where, it, where it would have been naturally or organically. So it accelerated it because what it meant is that now suddenly India is saying, okay, um, you know, um, why don't you come and help us with agriculture in Kashmir? So, so now there's Israelis working in Kashmir now, checking out agriculture, teaching Kashmiris how to grow, how to grow rice. <laughs> can you imagine like going, can you imagine how condescending that is? You know, sending the Israelis, going into, Israelis who steal Palestinian land, they steal land, okay? You can't grow anything without land. You steal land and then you steal water from the Palestinians. And then you go to African countries and you go to Kashmir and then you say, I'm going to teach you how to become sustainable and teach you how to uh, grow your stuff. Okay. So that's what the Abraham Accords does. It also creates an ecosystem, which is what I argue in the book. It creates an ecosystem in which Israel, the UAE, India, and the US are cross pollinating. You know, there's this cross pollination that takes place in, with regards to investments. You know, India is investing in Israel, Israel is investing in India. Israel is investing slowly into Kashmir, okay? UAE is investing in, UAE, uh, in, in Israel. The US is investing in, in the UAE. My point being that it's impossible to bring down these countries in any way. It's impossible to, to dismantle these structures because they're all so connected now. They're all so invested heavily in each other. They're going to defend each other till the death, basically. And, and essentially, everyone is complicit now. So everyone is, India is now totally involved with the, um, the, the occupation in, in Palestine, essentially. To give you one last example, you might, have, you might have heard of this guy, Adani, right? Who lost like $100 billion in like- Yes, yes. Unreal, right? Um, he is the business arm, okay, of, um, of Modi, basically. Now imagine it, imagine it this way. You want cement, you're most likely going to get cement from a company, like you know, build something in India, you're probably going to get cement from a company owned by Adani, okay? Uh, if you want to get some grain, you're probably going to get it from a company that Adani has some connection to. You want to take a flight, you're going to go to an airport that's owned by Adani. You want to send that, that, that cement or you want to send that grain to another country, it's going to a port that's owned by Adani, all right? So what happens in those places? It's not just about the transportation of goods and passengers. It's also about the surveillance of those goods and those passengers. So basically, Modi has a business arm like Adani, who's essentially tracking as well everyone. So, so basically, everyone is under one system. You know, the economy is not free in that way. It's completely in, in, a one, in one column, essentially. And so it's a major, major, major problem because if you are tracking the economy in such a way and it's, it's going to almost one person or to five people, then you're essentially reducing, you're, you're pushing everyone into, into, one, into one group, you know, and, and everyone, everyone's actions and everyone's behaviors are monitored, essentially. Um, it's like creating like a currency, like a digital currency, essentially, you're not even doing that, because it's all going through Adani, he can trace everything. If you want the banks, if you want this, you want, right? it's ridiculous. Now, um, putting that aside, Adani now owns, and this goes back to the topic at hand, if your listeners are not bored and uh, shutting down by now, um, the, the Adani now owns the Haifa port. Yes. 
I can't tell you what a big deal that is. I can't, I can't over like uh, overestimate uh, if that's the right phrase of putting this uh, or putting these words together. Um, Haifa port was the gateway for Jews from Europe coming into Palestine, to historic Palestine. So this was the first interaction between the Palestinians and these Jewish settlers that were coming in. And it was where the Nakba also pretty much started in a way, right? In which um, the, the, the Zionist militia really wanted control of that port. It's the biggest port in Israel today, and it was a major port under the British mandate as well. Um, they wanted major, they wanted to control the port. They kicked out Palestinians from their homes, put them on boats, and sent them to Lebanon, basically, right? And can you imagine that India's flag now fly, flies outside that port, essentially? You know, it's a, it, it, we're talking about the idea of countries trying to emulate each other. They are basically <laughs> they're basically planting their flag on that on that idea right now. I'm so sorry for this long answer. No, no, this is what I look for. Okay, so when we started this conversation, it, it, it took place in the 1940s, and India was not supportive of, of Israel, publicly at least. Now, how deep is India and Israel relationship now? Because India is the largest arms buyer of Israel. Is this relationship like a friendship now, or... Or is just until until they stop money, making money off of each other, where do you see this going? Okay, so again, this is a tough question to answer. Um, it's a very good question. I'm trying to give three or four points again here, and hopefully it won't go on for like three hours. No, no, don't worry, but, about, um, don't worry about time. It's the... Uh, so the short answer is that the relationship is deep. The relationship is deep because they, the two countries are seeing things in each other that they want to emulate and that they need from each other. That's the first thing. If you are Hindu nationalist, then you look at Israel or you look to Israel as a model. Mm -hmm. As I said to you earlier, you admire the militarism. You admire the, the unashamed sort of like religious zealotry of Israel. So um, under the Congress party, you know, they, they, the Hindu nationalists claim that, you know, uh, India was appeasing Muslims, you know. It was um, trying to be overtly secular and it was sort of pushing down the Hindu, um, the Hindu nature, you know, of the country, right? So they look at Israel and they go, no, they're not doing that, right? So we want to be that. They're... If you're an Indian liberal, you look at Israel and you actually secretly admire them. That's the unfortunate thing that people don't really want to understand. To an Indian liberal, the occupation is ugly. Um, and you don't necessarily support it. But you also, you know, you quite like what Israel has done for itself. It's sort of like a first world country in a way, you know, for Israelis. South Africa was also a first world country for South African whites. Okay. So you kind of admire it. And there's this kind of idea that, you know, if India is rough with Kashmiris or it's rough with Indian Muslims, but kind of leaves us alone in a way, then, and if it develops like Israel in a way, we could live with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a big problem. And that's, that's, that, that, that's like a, you know, British level of like uh, cynicism, you know, uh, where it's like very two-faced. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a really messed up. And I think more work needs to be done on, on that, like hypothesis and such. But, you know, it's all doom and gloom. I don't think that ordinary farmers and ordinary people's movements in India, I don't think they feel for Israel on a deep level. Um, you know, I'm not saying that they are pro-Palestinian necessarily. I think these are ideas necessary, that they don't necessarily uh, fit within their immediate concern. You know, it's a bit abstract. I'm not saying that they don't know what's going on. That would be very... Uh, patronizing um but i'm saying on a on a on an everyday level i think these are you know, th th these matters are abstract but what's not abstract is the question of what does israel represent okay and if they understood that 
And I think farmers, the farmers movement, uh, one of the biggest farmers unions in India is a supporter of BDS, for instance. It makes yeah. sense. Uh, it makes sense because they realize that Israel stands for privatization. Israel stands for, for unfettered capitalism. Israel stands for killing unions. Israel stands for, um, you know, big capital. Israel stands for impunity. And I think they wouldn't want to be close to it. So in terms of, in terms of this fight, this fight is not just about Israel. And that's why it's very important, you know, to understand that Israel is not about this Jews versus Muslims. Of course, there's Islamophobia. Of course, there's anti-Semitism in Europe. And, and they try to portray or, or paint this as a, 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 a people's criticism of Israel as being anti-Semitic. You know, that's, that's bogus. But, you know, the issue here is much deeper than that. It's, it's, about, it's about land. It's about occupation. It's about settler colonialism. You know, it's about ethnic cleansing. And that has repercussions for other places because these techniques are used to, displaced, to, to displace and take over other people's lands and lives in a similar manner. But it may not be couched in like Zionism as such, but it's a similar kind of result. You know? And so when you ask me, is this a deep relationship? Yes, it's a deep relationship. Um, but yet at the same time, it's not insurmountable. Um, it's not insurmountable because fundamentally, the, the, if people understand that Israel, sta Israel means these kinds of things, there's no way they want to be part of it because they understand that, that it's going to impact them ultimately too. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, for Israel to do the things that they've done, you need a pretty good lobbying in the United States, all right? Uh, Israeli has one of the most powerful lobby groups in America. How's the Indian lobby groups in uh, in the United States? So today, the 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 Hindu nationalist movement in India um, receives um, most of its support from the U.S. and it comes from Indian Americans um, in New Jersey, in Texas in um, California. And uh, they are, you know, they're becoming a powerful lobby in, in the US. And uh, there are many parts. One is that they received help from APAC. You know, you might've heard of APAC. Yes. The Israel Public Affairs Committee. It was APAC in the early nineties uh, when Indian Americans started properly organizing to do work on Capitol Hill. It was APAC that essentially helped Indian Americans learn how to lobby. Wow. And this is documented. They were the ones that organized internships for young Indian Americans with U.S. congressmen, congresswomen. They helped them understand how to reach politicians and how to con you know, get your message across. And... The question is then, why would that be the case? And that goes back to the original question. India wanted to become close to the US and uh, Zionists want India to be close to Israel. And so you have this Indian community that wants more power in the US. They have economic power, but they didn't really have much political power. And so they want to have some influence and they want to emulate this Jewish community, so-called Jewish community that they see as powerful. It's weird because it's not, the Jewish community is not a monolith also. Uh, Jewish community, uh, community has so many like anti-Zionists involved, but they were looking at the Zionist Jews, pro-Israel Jews, and looking at them and saying, we want to be like you, essentially. Right. Small community that has influence, basically. And, and so the Zionists were very happy to help them because it meant that if India gets closer to Israel, it gives more legitimacy to Israel. You know, why, would in, why does Israel want legitimacy from India? It gets the biggest and the, 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 the largest democracy in the world, so-called, to be on their side. India then brings all its allies with it. You know, um, India and South Africa are very close, but South Africa is a big 
proponent of the Palestinians, right? And it's it's not as clear cut as what I'm saying. I mean, South Africa also has weird deals with uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli military, but overall, you know, they still stand up for Palestinians. And I'm very curious to know like how South Africa and India talk about Israel and Palestine these days, because they are so, you know, so pulled apart. So, um, you know, to, to, to have uh, India on your side in that way is, is a big deal. So, so the, the, the Indian American Indian American lobby as such has also tried to work with the Israelis, work with the Zionist lobby, and also try to create the impression that to be Indian American is to be Hindu. Okay. So they've also erased Muslims from that. So when you think about like a brown Muslim in the US, you are actually thinking about Pakistanis, you know, or obviously the Arab world, you know, but you're not thinking of an Indian American Muslim. And that has, that is very, very dangerous. And also uh, obviously from an anthropological perspective, it's fascinating how a group can try to do that, like on the other side of the world. So um, this means that, you know, when you, t when, when people talk about Indian Americans, they are talking about what Hindus want essentially. So they've been able to uh, twist, you know, that meaning as well. Um, you know, to go further, today you have Indian Americans across the political spectrum, right? You have Rokana, you have Pramila Jayapal, you know, you have many Indian Americans who are in like uh, local government positions and um, they're becoming influential. You know, you have Nikki Haley now. Yeah, yeah. She's probably gonna run for president. If that hasn't been announced already, and she's not going to obviously win. I mean, I mean, in America, you can't actually make any predictions, but uh, true, uh, it's unlikely. But who do you think is going to be supporting her? You know, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, Indian Americans are also very involved in the media, very high up in the, in the mainstream media in the U.S. Um, they also, as I said to you, in television, like so much shows, we, we talk about representation, you know, um, but the representation is very upper caste Hindu um, dominant, you know, creating a very specific type of Hindu identity on television is very problematic and very, very uh, isolating for those of um, from lower castes, from Indian Muslims, like the Indian shows, they, they, you know, they're trying to be diverse uh, in the way they portray characters, but it's, it's a very specific type of Indian Americans, you know, very ty specific type of, um, you know, uh, upper caste as well as being uh, rich um, and all of that, right? Um, you think about, um, you know, uh, Mira Nair's um, Mississippi Masala, right? Yeah. You know, that that is like 200 times more interesting and more representative like in some way than what's happening today and that happened so many years ago you know in terms of portraying a character portraying character development talking about the issues in the community you know um it's actually more interesting then than what it is now and yet we are celebrating that representation now so th so there's a problem and, and and indian americans are therefore uh containing and also defining the contours of the conversation in the US regarding India, regarding Hindus, regarding Hindutva, regarding Kashmir, um, regarding all of South Asia and including Pakistan. Um, they are defining that and that's, that's a problem. So for instance, I think about Congressman Khanna. In 2019, he said that, quote, it was the duty of every American politician of Hindu faith to stand for pluralism and reject Hindutva. You know, it's what three years later, or well, it's almost four years now. But uh, in 2022, it was Ro Khanna that called on the U.S. government to facilitate more strategic weapon deals with Delhi. Okay, so India has uh, not taken a, a, a full stance. You know, not taken a, a pro uh, Ukraine stance in this war that's been taking place. Right, 
it still has deals with Russia and it still imports oil. Funny enough, um, uh, the US and some European countries, uh, actually Israel itself are getting oil, Russian oil via India at this point in time, okay? So all of this just shows you how fake everything is. It's like you have these big sanctions on Russia. And on one hand, you are saying no one should be dealing with them. On the other hand, India still has relations with Russia and, 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 and it's getting oil and then um, I think mining it, et cetera. And then they're selling it across. In fact, Israel, this uh, in December, Israel spent $1 billion on uh, uh, petroleum products from India. And most of it was Russian stuff. Anyway. Um, the point about Rokana is that because India still has relationships with Russia regarding weapons, the U.S. government is supposed to sanction India as a result. And so Rokana, in mid-2022, he tried to essentially, uh, well, he was actually successful. Uh, he, he set a motion in, pro progress to, uh, in process to uh, ensure that the Indian government is not sanctioned for still buying weapons from Russia, okay? An amendment to a law, basically. Wow. Can you imagine that this war has cost Americans so much money, right? And there's like a, there's a crisis over here, you know? There's a recession um, and uh, things are not, not healthy here. And so much money is being sent there. And yet you have someone who said that this a couple of years ago that it was every duty, a duty of every American politician to stand up to, uh, to Hindutva and now he's saying, please make sure that they're not sanctioned for buying arms, one. Two, let's make sure that we sell more arms to Delhi so that they don't have to defend that subtext, right? They don't have to defend on Russia. Can you imagine, like, this is the kind of stuff. And that's an Indian-American, okay? Uh, Jayapal, um, you know, she said something, uh, she, she spoke out. Uh, against India after 2019's uh, revocation of um, Kashmir. Kashmir, right? She said, and she, all she said was that um, India should um, respect, you know, the rights of Kashmiris. That's all she said. Nothing. She didn't say anything else, right? Um, and um, the Indian foreign minister refused to meet her, essentially. And she wrote a piece that said that uh, she, you know, even though she was ignored by the Indian foreign ministry, she won't stop talking about things in India. But you do a cursory Google search and see if she said anything over the past year or past two years about India, and you find that she hasn't said anything, right? They're all falling in line, right? Um, you know, the, the other day I, I wrote this piece, um, uh, it's, it said like, you know, in June 2022, uh, Representative Ilan Omar introduced a resolution calling the State Department to designate India as a country of particular concern under the International Religious Freedom Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was following uh, recommendations by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, right, that, that, that described India as a country of particular concern. So she, she called for a resolution and both Jayapal and Ro Khanna did not co-sponsor it. Of course, the resolution didn't, did not even make it to the floor because no resolution condemning India makes it to the floor anyway these days, right? But you have two Indian Americans who stayed away from it. So what you find is that the Indian American lobby is spending millions and millions of dollars trying to shut Congress up when it comes to this, these matters. And it's both sides of the aisle. It's the, 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 the Democrats and it's the, the Republicans. Um, and in, at the moment, the, the reason is China. You know, um, we, we, we need an ally. You know, that's what they say. The US needs an ally uh, in the fight against China. So minorities in India, you know, whether they're Dalit, they're Christian, they're Muslim, they're Sikh, uh, they can go to hell, basically. Well, we need this assistance. Yeah, My last question, after all this, what does this mean for India? And, and what do you think the future holds for India? Yeah. Um, so, you know, this blueprint that we people have referred to, like, you know, India sort of like uh, taking on or adopting the Israeli blueprint, blueprint that, that has long started, you know. So India's future is already here in a way. And it's frightening. Honestly, it's very, very frightening. 
you cannot have a proper conversation with a Kashmiri on any type of device, um, you know, any of these like apps, Telegram or uh, definitely not WhatsApp, <laughs> Telegram or Signal, um, because it's impossible for them to know if they're being surveilled or not. Um, you know, journalism in Kashmir is completely, com completely under the hammer. If you say anything that is deemed to be problematic to the state, and even stuff that is not even problematic at all to the state, like they just don't like it, um, they are they are putting you on a list essentially. And there are many Kashmiri journalists who are on no-fly lists now. They can't fly out of Kashmir, and I know some of them personally, and it's horrific. Um, you're basically suffocating uh, voices, and you're suffocating um, the ability for people to to actually express themselves in any way. You've also seen in Kashmir uh, the dismantling of civil society. So, you know, people might think that I'm talking about Kashmir and saying, okay, right, cool, this is like one example, but it's not, you know? This is happening in India itself. You might've heard about the BBC documentary, right? Um, and people were obsessed with how Elon Musk dealt with it, like blocking tweets and stuff. But forget about Elon, Elon Musk, okay? Elon Musk was never going to be a paragon for or of, uh, free speech. It was never the case. They have been blocking people's um, internet. They've been blocking people's ability to report. They've been harassing civil society for, for, for many years. It's, it's, it's horrific right now in India. Um, the, if you are Indian Muslim and you speak out against the state in any way, like if you uh, essentially, um, you know, spoke out about the Citizen Amendment Act, you know, um, they bulldoze your home, you know. So that future is already here. In fact, what's really fascinating in this way is that it's so transparent. You know, the same bulldozers being used in India, the same bulldozers being used in Kashmir, are the same bulldozers being used in Palestine. The same bulldozers, I mean, when I say the same, I don't mean they look the same, they're the same company, okay? JCB. JCB is a British firm that basically uh, has a subsidiary in, in uh, India and they are going around and bulldozing places. So, and I hope your like, listeners, listeners look it up because they're also on a UN list of companies that are operating in the, in the settlements. Um, so, so what's the future look like? It, the future, as I said, is already here. They're criminali criminalizing dissent. And in this way, it's not just India borrowing from Israel. Israel is actually borrowing tactics from India. You might have heard about the civil society uh, organizations, the six uh, human rights organizations that have been slapped with terror charges in, in Israel. Um, this, this has been happening in India already. Um, and you may know, uh, or your listeners may know that Amnesty International does not exist in India anymore. In, in uh, I think three years ago, they were forced to leave India. And the other country that they were forced to leave is Russia. There's only two countries, right? That they've been forced to leave. They exist in other places. They don't exist in, in, um, in India. And likewise, uh, you think about the BBC office that was raided last week. In Gaza last year, they, the, the Israelis bombed the Associated Press and Al Jazeera offices, you know? So the similarities are completely clear. Um, so yeah, things are not looking great. Things are looking very bleak. But as I said to you earlier, is that it's really about, you know, people understanding what this is all about, you know? Uh, India is moving towards the direction of an oligarchy, you know, oligarchy ruled uh, country where you have a handful of billionaires that basically control everything. And you have the state that basically just, you know, um, helps facilitate that business. Uh, so business basically props up the fascist policies and, this, and, the, and the fascist policies prop up the business basically. Uh, and each one essentially helps surveil everyone. And ultimately, this is not just about India. This is about other places as well, because India is producing, co-producing Israeli arms. So if you are not a friend of Israel, but you're a friend of India, then you are most likely 
going to be okay with buying weapons from India, but these are Israeli weapons. And so then other places start becoming part of this ecosystem in which you're not only um, investing and helping subsidize the occupation, but you are beginning to, you're beginning to like uh, use undemocratic measures and use the methods in Palestine and use the methods in Kashmir for your own countries as well, basically, because it's an easy way to suppress people. So that's ultimately what this is all about. And I guess that's what, I mean, the final chapter of my book talks about, you know, it's about this ecosystem that's being built. Um, and everyone is involved. And, but there are ways of like dismantling it if you are seeing these fascist powers like kind of working together. Wow. Thank you so much. I think that's, that's the time we have. Do you want to, do you want to talk about your book? No, nah, not really. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will talk about your book. It's really, really fascinating book and I really recommend it. It's, it's really important, especially now, as you can see, and if you do buy it, if you do buy it, buy it from the publisher's website, which is Pluto website or a local bookstore. And if you do buy it from the Pluto website, Pluto Press website, uh, use this promo code ESSA20 and you'll get 20% off. And what that's a great excuse to buy the book. All right. Thank you, Azad. This was great. Thanks for holding in your sneeze. And let's 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 wrap this up. A lot to digest. Okay, thank you, Asen. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for the good question.